Good morning. My name is Al Houghton, and this is The Word at Work. And we're really glad to have you here because we're doing a school of the spirit with one goal in mind, and that is to prepare to represent the Lord in fullness in the last days. And that, of course, means developing a relationship with the Godhead who is in here. And what we have been doing is looking at the school of the spirit that Jesus conducted, which was right before he went to Gethsemane. And the 12 were really concerned and almost panic mode, but maybe just on the edge. Uh, we're about to lose everything. And Jesus said, no, no, actually, you're getting a three for one exchange. So they, they didn't understand that but we do from where we are right now. And the Lord opened that up and said, I've never taught on this before. And God brought me there and said, why don't you teach on the school of the spirit that Jesus conducted for the 12 right before he paid the price? And uh, five chapters in John, John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. And we have been on this for a season. I mean, there's a lot here. It is amazing. And today we want to talk about uh, wrestling with God. Re really, it's, it's relating to God. But sometimes that relating to God has some wrestling, and there's definitely some warfare in it. Because the Lord has already said, the season has changed. And this is this, you're now entering the season dominated by the Father. We have lived in a season dominated by the Spirit. Um, the truth is, we have all three right here. And that was what Jesus said to them that sets the stage for this whole thing. And in John chapter 14, it shows up with the Greek word mone in my 14.2. I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house are many Monet dwelling places, mansions. Now it's uh, translated King James, New King James. And I am going uh, to prepare, but it's only used twice. Both of them are in 14. So, and that is the neat part of how this unfolds. Because in 14.2, in my father's house are many Monet mansions. We're not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a tapas for you. When you get to verse 23, uh, Judas, not Iscariot, said, uh, "How, Lord, how is it that you're going to manifest yourself to us and not to the world? I mean, I, are you going to be hidden? Are you? I, how's that work? How can you manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And here's Jesus' answer, second Monet, all right? Jesus answered and said to him, Any, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. There's your three for one exchange. Jesus, I'm leaving, but once I pay the price, once I ascend into heaven, once I present the blood, then the Father is going to send the Holy Spirit, and I will come with the Holy Spirit and with the Father, and we will make our permanent dwelling place with you. You're the temple from here on. You are our address. So where you are, we are. I, I will manifest, we will manifest ourselves to you, and then what you do will demonstrate to the world that we're alive. You are my witnesses. Isaiah 44, verse 8. I mean, it's right, it's right there. You are my witness. God's declaration to Israel, to covenant believers, you are my witnesses. Well, here we are. We, we are God's witnesses. And guess what happens? As that's 14, that's preparation. Then you get to 15, the Father's divine. Oh yeah, the vine dresser. We are uh, we are branches in the vine, and so every branch brings forth fruit. Oh wow, 
So we have walked all the way through this and we are up to now 16. But in John 15, 26 and 27, he introduced, sets the stage for 16 where the emphasis is on the Father, all right? And since the Lord has declared that prophetically, the season for the Father coming to us to build his relationship with us for what's ahead. Hallelujah. Because the Father is the star of the show in the last days. I mean, the book of Revelation is about the Father. He's the one who winds up the age. Jesus said himself, look, I don't know the day nor hour. The Father has kept that in his own timing. So the Father has kept a few things for the last days. And so the Father now is what Jesus finishes this off with in teaching uh, the school of the Spirit, the Father's coming. So listen to the last two verses of John 15. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father. Now that's the emphasis. The Helper is coming from the Father. The Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. <laughs> Listen, the Holy Spirit, number one, going to represent the Father. They, they are one, three but one, from the Father. Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. The Spirit is the one who anoints us to testify in the last days, we will testify of Jesus, but, okay, next verse. See, the, this, the testifying now becomes an issue of relationship. Look at this next verse. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So when it comes to testimony, what does the testimony consist of? When you testify, you testify out of who you have been with. And so the Godhead now dwells in us. We are the temple, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're making their home, Monet Mansion, in us. And the Father is saying, I am coming to develop relationship because you are going to represent the fullness of the Godhead in the last days. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, fullness. And, and most of us, the Father has a distinct voice. I mean, all his own. I mean, is he talk about somebody who speaks with authority, he does. Now, the interesting part of chapter 16 is the first verse, where Jesus, by the Spirit, identifies what is the chief um, barrier to developing relationship with the Father. It's sort of a stumbling block, can we say. 16.1, John 16.1, these things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. Now, everything Jesus has done so far in the school of the Spirit, 13, 14, John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 is aimed at one goal that the believer should not stumble. What is stumble? Greek word, skandalizo, skandalizo, be offended. To stumble means to be offended and therefore depart from one you ought to trust and obey. To walk away from one that you ought to trust and obey, to be offended. All this, Jesus said, I'm teaching that has this purpose, so that you don't walk away because you're offended. Now, scandalizo is the word, but it all, there's a family of words here, scandalon. The, I mean, the actual offense, a scandalon. It's, it's, now, scandalizo is the fruit of it. It's where you choose to walk away because you, you can't overcome it. All right, so... The father, he's a little different. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. I'm telling you, he's here. He's showing up. 
I mean, your dad is a good dad. That's obvious from what Jesus did for us. And I mean, and uh, all the things the Holy Spirit is assigned to show us the good things that God has prepared for us. But there's some growth here that has to take place to get to know the Father. And there's also some recognizing, are there any offenses that are probably so deep they're buried, we, we overlook them or, or just try to plaster them over and move on. There's no way to fully develop the relationship with the Father without dealing with, uh, God does things sometimes that are offensive. I mean, he'll wait way longer than we think he should to deliver us or, or give us what we need or why are you putting me through this? Why? Where are you to deliver us? Or God comes in a, a way we don't recognize him. And there, there's just a hundred different ways that offense can develop. And who is the master of picking offenses? Oh, well, that's the enemy that you and I have. So he will create one if he can. So let's take some time and look at this issue as we work our way through Matthew 16 and open up, uh, hopefully, the fullness of what Jesus was teaching and warning us about here so we get an idea of how some of these things uh, unfold. Did they unfold with, the, with yes. I mean, we, we just read 16.1, but if you know the story, and I know you do, was every single one of the 12 offended? <laughs> yeah, yes, they, they were. How did that happen? Well, maybe the same way it's going to come at us in the days ahead. So maybe we ought to read this and look at this as preparation so that we don't fall in the same trap they did. Now, was God faithful to bring him back? Absolutely. Was he faithful to work through the offense? Absolutely. So we know God's on our side. Hallelujah. So let's take this verse, these things I have spoken to you, John 16, 1, uh, uh, that you should not be made to stumble. Now, when you look at that in the Greek, I mean, every once in a while, there's this unique Greek construction, and it's a blinking neon sign every time you see it. And it just so happens that this is one of those. So if you were looking at Greek, you would stop there and go, whoa, this is one of the most important things I've seen so far. Why? Okay. These things I have spoken to you. Scandalizo, scandalizo. That's construction in Greek. And that's the end of the sentence in Greek. These things I've spoken to you, I translated that, but if I were to say that to you in Greek, scandalizo, scandalizo, period. Whoa. Blinking neon light. So how did they translate that? These things I have spoken to you, scandalizo, that you should not be offended, scandalizo, stumble and walk away. But in the Greek, it's just these things I've spoken to you, scandalizo, scandalizo, period. Now that's a, whoa, okay, we got to look at this. It's the double. And so if it's a double test, it's the key to the double anointing is in passing this test, in overcoming these offenses with the Father, we guarantee that we will walk with him to the pinnacle of our gifting and calling. If we can overcome the offenses. Hallelujah. Scandalizo, scandalizo, the key to the double. All right, that's number one. That's why it's worth looking at. So what are we going to do? We are going to back up. <laughs> yeah, are we ever? We're going to back up to Matthew chapter five, and we're going to take a look at offense. So let's pick it up in verse Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verse, oh yeah, 27, 27 to 30. Here we go. Sermon on the Mount, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you 
that whoever looks at a woman to lust after her already committed adultery with her in his heart. And if your right eye, ah, scandalizo. Woo. Circle verse 29. If your right eye causes you to stumble and walk away from God into rebellion and disobedience, pluck it out, cast it from you. Now, did Jesus literally mean to pluck? No. What he's saying is take dramatic action. When you recognize you're dealing with a test, something that's offensive to God, whether it's sin or whether it's something God does. Now, we, you know, I said that the verse 16.1, John 16.1, warns us about things that God does that can be offensive and cause us to stumble. But now, when we're going back to look at the word, okay, obviously it's used in the context of what causes us to offend God and stumble. And so this is the context, but watch the context change as we move through. If your right eye causes you, okay, so when you're dealing with an offense, whether it's the kind that uh, you and I can cause God or whatever, take drastic action. An offense requires drastic action to cut it off so that you and I don't commit it or to deal with it so we don't accuse God of it, okay? Regardless of what the source of the offense is, it requires dramatic action. Now, that's the first thing you and I learn, because this is the first appearance of scandalizo in the New Testament. It is something that demands drastic action on our part. So that's the first lesson we learn about the subject of offense, whether it's we're tempted to commit it and walk away or whether we're going to accuse God of it, whatever the source is, an offense is serious. It is one of the most serious issues of scripture, and it requires dramatic action on our part. Lesson number one, an offense requires dramatic action. That's what he's teaching so far. Um, and why? If your right eye causes you uh, to sin, offend, offend, stumble, pluck it out, cast it from you, it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than that your whole body should be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to offend, sin, cut it off, cast it from you, it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than that your whole body be cast into hell. All right. Now, that's the first lesson. Although it's in a different area, it's the enemy tempting us to sin, take drastic action, still applies. Still applies if you and I get offended with God. That, that's, that's an issue of drastic action. Okay, let's go to the next place now. We find offense, and that is in Matthew chapter 11. Why are we looking at different areas? Because each one of these show us something we need to know about the subject of offense. Now, see, you may be thinking, well, hey, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I got decades under my belt. There's no way I'm going to be offended. But uh, so there was somebody else who felt that way. No way he was going to be offended. And he said so. And that was Peter. And he was offended more than anybody else. <laughs> three times. Everybody else was what? Peter was three. I mean, Oh, hallelujah. Let's, let's go. See, you and I are not the best judge of how we are going to navigate the offense. But God knows. God knows how we're going to navigate offenses when they come. He is our best ally in navigating an offense. And that's where you rely on the Holy Spirit. That's where you rely on Jesus. And he will help us negotiate and completely uh, grow into the fullness of our relationship with the Father. We got help. Hallelujah. And that's the good news. So let's go to Matthew chapter 11. Verse 1. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples, he departed from there 
to teach and preach in their cities. Verse 2, when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, are you the coming one or do we look for another? What? Now, is this the same John the Baptist that baptized Jesus? Yes. Who saw the dove, who heard the witness, who heard the father. This is my beloved son in him. Yes, this is the same guy. Are you the coming one or do we look for another? Now, what if that statement is a statement of somebody who is offended with Jesus? Why would John the Baptist be offended? Well, maybe Jesus didn't walk the way John had to walk. Let's look. The context will tell us, and it does. Okay, it does. Verse 4, Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you now see and hear. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Wow. Verse 6, blessed is he who is not scandalizo because of me. Now, why did Jesus just say that? Tell John, John, you need to deal with offense. Now, if John the Baptist needed to deal with offense, you and I can just about bet there's a day coming when you and I are going to have to deal. If we haven't had it already, it's coming and we're going to have to. There's a day coming when if we are going to continue walking with the Father, the test is offense. Can we overcome it? Yes, we can, but the power, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Of course we can. All right, verse 7. As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? No. Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. Oh, you need to hear this. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now, what was Jesus talking about? He was talking about the old covenant versus the new covenant. He was here ministering under the old covenant, but by the anointing that was coming in the new. So Jesus was a picture of the new covenant that was coming, but he ministered to wind up the old. And what is he saying? He's saying John the Baptist was the greatest of the prophets under the Old Testament. But those of you that are born again, those of you that get the three, four, one switch, Jesus, I'm going away, but I'm coming back when I do. I'm bringing the Spirit, I'm bringing the Father, and we are going to make our home in you. You become sons and daughters of God. Family exceeds servanthood. Under the old covenant, you're servants. Under the new covenant, you're family. Chosen, holy, blameless, uh, adopted, number four in Ephesians chapter one. We started chosen, got interrupted and said, stop, go to uh, John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. It's a school of the spirit. Jesus conducted, go through it, line upon line, precept on precept, teach it right now, then go pick up what you started. Well, why did we start that? Because there are nine sonship gifts that Jesus bought and paid for 
that eradicate blame, shame, and guilt so you can perfectly represent God based on his word. You have good soil, and your soil will receive the word and grow it up. It's Paul's testimony. Holy Spirit came to me three years ago, right here in this office, in this seat where I'm sitting right now. I'm going to teach you Ephesians the way I taught it to the Apostle Paul. It is his testimony about God delivered him from blame, shame, and guilt. Hallelujah. Now, our website has got those Bible studies on it, two years of them. Hallelujah. And it'll help. So what are we doing? We are doing the Bible. <laughs> Have we had any warfare? Oh, just a little bit. Hallelujah. A couple of weeks ago, I almost checked out. God said, oh, no, you're not done yet. You haven't finished what I sent you to do. So I lived in resurrection life for three hours while they were getting ready to put a stent in my heart. And as soon as the blood flow started, I saw it. I mean, it, I woke up and the surgeons got, okay, you awake? I want to show you something. Somebody upstairs likes you. You shouldn't be here. <laughs> See this? This is a picture of your heart, 100% blocked. Plaque broke loose somewhere in the arteries, and just filled the right side. So it was 100 for three hours. There was no blood flow. God was my blood flow. We've talked about this. I'm repeating myself, okay? But, but God brought me back from the, well, he didn't let me die to start with. I was going to say he brought me back from the dead. No, that's not exactly true. He didn't let me die to start with. He said, you're going to live in resurrection life. You're going to finish your race. You're not done. Go back there and finish this series. And then finish the other sonship, get my people ready for what's ahead. That's why we're doing this. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm not gone. I mean, this is the voice that was right on the edge of eternity and came rocking back to finish what we're talking about right here. How important is this? It is your life. It is your future. It is your anointing in, in the days ahead. Now, you talk about a preparation for persecution. This is it. You develop a relationship with the Father and I mean, you've got a relationship with the living fire of God. Our God is a consuming fire. When he baptized them in the Holy Spirit, there was fire that came with it. What did that represent? The Father. From the Father. From the Father. We already read the last two verses of 15. And 16, 1, you got to get ready for it. John the Baptist faced it. If John the Baptist faces it, you and I are going to face it. But we learned something from this passage about John the Baptist. What do we learn? We learn anyone in the new covenant is greater than John the Baptist because you are family and you have the Trinity right here. You are Zion. You are the temple of the living God and God dwells in you. That's why you're greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist couldn't hold a candle to what's on the inside of you, the fullness of the Godhead. And Ephesians promises, that's what you're going to walk in in the last days. Oh, yeah, fullness, fullness, fullness. That's the high priestly prayer of the Apostle Paul, that you would walk in the fullness of Christ. That's Father, Son, and Spirit. Well, here comes the Father. All right. But you have to do something about this. You have to take dramatic action. What kind of act? Well, listen, listen to, let me read it. You need to do this. It's important. This is who you are. This is an issue of your identity before God. Verse 12, Matthew 11, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. What does that mean? That means you have to be spiritually violent over the issue of who you are. You are more than a sinner saved by grace. You're a son and daughter of the living God. You are the temple of the living God. And you need to think in terms of your sons. You need to take your sonship. You need to take your position as a family member of God and violently appropriate it and refuse to accept any other voice and anything else. You have to see yourself the way the Bible says you are. You're a son and daughter of the most high. You're in God's family. 
your father dwells in you. He is a prayer away, a breath away. Woo! For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you're willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. Well, so much for God sending Elijah and Moses, not going to be Elijah. John was the Elijah to come. It says so right here. Well, who are the witnesses? Who are the two witnesses in Revelation? Well, it tells you. It tells you in the verse. We already looked at that. We answered that question once last week. Shouldn't have to do it again. How do people get offended? What offends people that comes from God? They read a promise in Scripture and they read it into what they want instead of saying, God, show me what how it unfolds in your account. Uh huh. And when it doesn't happen the way they think it should happen, they are offended by God and walk away in the last days. Well, you better be able to show me that in the word. Well, let's see if the pattern that the word presents holds true. It's, it's just that simple. Let, let's see. What does the Bible say about offense? Was John offended? Well, we're not through yet. Jesus is about to tell us why he thought John was offended and needed to deal with offense. Aha. Uh -huh. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I like in this generation? Verse 16. We are Matthew 11, verse 16. But to what shall I like in this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplace, calling to their companions and saying, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourned to you, but you did not lament. Here's the verse. Ding. Verse 18. John came neither eating nor drinking. A Nazarite, the vow of a Nazarite, holy, dedicated to God, both naturally and spiritually, under the old covenant, under the law. For John came neither eating or drinking, and they say he has a demon. Verse 19. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. How did Jesus live compared to John? Offensive lifestyle. This can't be the son of God. He's eating and drinking with sinners. He's drinking wine. This can't be the son of God. <laughs> Hmm, offense. <laughs> wow, offense. Offense. Wisdom is justified by her children. Does God use that as a growth tool? Is offense a growth tool with God? Well, apparently it is. And what is Jesus saying? What did Jesus say to John? Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Did John get the message? He sure did. He got it because he went to his grave victorious. Hallelujah. He got it. He overcame his offense. Jesus didn't live like John. Jesus didn't live as a Nazareth. He went out after the sinners. He came as covenant mercy. Woo. Wow. What are we going to do with this? Well, you know what? That is a real, that's an absolute great question. Because, you know, when you, when you go back to Matthew chapter 3 and you see what John experienced in verse 13 through 17, then Jesus came from Galilee to John to Jordan to be baptized. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. 
And Jesus said, we need to do this. Permit it to be so now. It's fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. It fulfills scripture. That's why we need to do it. Then Jesus, when he'd been baptized, came up immediately from the water. Behold, the heavens were open. He saw the spirit of God descending like a dove, alighting on him. Suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And all you have to do is go over to Matthew chapter 11 and the same John who was there sends to Jesus and says, after all that, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Of course he's offended when he looked there telling him the lifestyle of Jesus. That didn't match what he had to live. So he's naturally wondering. So it opens the door for offense. Ooh, whoa, man, I'm telling you. This is something else. Yeah, it really is. There, there is no doubt about it. And we're not done yet. Let's go to the next scandalizo. So what are we following? We're following Scandalizo, as it appears, first, second, third, through the book of Matthew, to see if we can open up these different scenarios that we possibly are going to have to deal with as we grow in our relationship with the Father. All right, and let's go to verse 54, Matthew 13, verse 54. All right, and when he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Now, Jesus in his own hometown. Oh, boy, you know that's going to be interesting. <laughs> they knew him. They knew him as a kid. They knew his mom. They knew his brothers. They knew his family. And all of a sudden, now he's here under this anointing as the Messiah and what do you do if you know somebody's background? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? Verse 57, Matthew 13. So they were scandalizo at him. Now, what did he just have to go over with John the Baptist? Blessed is he who's not offended in me. He goes to his hometown. Everybody there is offended because they knew him when he was growing up. They cannot accept that the kid they knew is now manifesting the anointing of the Messiah of Israel. What you know and who you know can really be a hindrance. A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. They were offended. What does offense put you in? It puts you in unbelief and you can't participate with God. It sidelines you. What did Jesus say? If you recognize offense, take drastic action immediately. Don't fool with it. Take drastic action. Oh, my. Well, let's go over to chapter 16 and see if we can work our way through this. Oh, hallelujah. All right. Not Matthew 16. John 16, okay? John 16, verse 1. These things I've spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. Ooh, well, how successful was that? They all said they, they were going to strike the shepherd. Oh, yeah, okay. Hang on. We're, we'll go there in a minute. But right now, let's, let's work our way through this. Verse 2, 16, 2. They will put you out of the synagogue. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think he offers God service. Now, what did Jesus just say? Jesus is saying, hey, there is coming a season at the end of the age when the enemy is going to strike. Hello? The enemy is going to strike. 
I mean, you need to get ready for major league persecution. Oh yeah, see if with uh, well, I, maybe maybe I jumped out of Matthew a little too soon. Maybe we should have picked up Matthew twenty six. All right, so go back to Matthew twenty six. We'll pick that up and then we will try to finish. Okay, here we go. Man, last example, fourth example out of Matthew of scandal leads up. Here it is. Pick it up, Matthew 26, verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, all of you will be scandal leads up because of me this night, for it is written. All of you. Now, what do we just read in Matthew 16? This is written that you may not be, made, that you may not. This is written, scandal leads up, scandal leads up. So that you're warned about the power of offense and you learn to cut it off. We can learn something from what's unfolding here. There's coming, it, the very last thing the apostles had to deal with was a covenant strike and they weren't ready for it. So what do you think that means for us? There's some stuff coming that we're probably not ready for. Is the rapture one of them? It could be. I hope not. I hope we're out of here. Man, I'm with you. I want to get out of here as fast as we can get out of here. Heaven's nice. I've been there three times. Tried to go again. And no, not yet. Okay, so what are you going to do? Get ready for persecution. Hallelujah. And if you have to go through it, don't be offended. They had to go through it. And they they all denied Christ. We're out of here. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. <laughs> better covenant, better promises, power within. And what was the first thing Jesus said? You will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? Power to witness. Power to overcome the offense of a strike. Hallelujah. <laughs> well, is there a pattern? See, and now the, the issue for us is really simple. Is there a pattern here of Offense. All of you will be made to scandalizo because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to scandalizo because of you, I will never scandalizo. <laughs> okay, Peter, are we the best judge of how? Equipped we are to overcome offense? Not really. Peter wasn't. And maybe you and I aren't either. Maybe we need to go to God and say, um, Holy Spirit, is, am I, is there any offense that I don't even recognize? It's so covered over. Maybe it's so deep. Maybe the hurt was so deep. The wind was so deep. It's covered over. I don't even know. Is there any offense in there that I don't recognize? Maybe you and I need to pray that prayer. I mean, after you take a look at Peter, Peter wasn't the best judge. His judgment was wrong. And maybe ours is too. So, so what do you do? You just ask. The, you ask the spirit. He's the spirit of truth. He won't lie to you. He'll tell you. He knows if you're offended or if he knows if you've overcome it. And, and you just ask, okay, Lord, is there an offense there that I still need to overcome some of it? And if he brings up an incident, then you say, okay, I see it. I recognize it for what it is. I take drastic action. I cut it off in Jesus' name. I choose to forgive. Father, I choose to forgive you for putting me through that. When you could have delivered, you could have healed, you could have done it, you put me through all this stuff. And it didn't have to be that way because Jesus bought and paid for something else, but I haven't seen it. It's a promise. You made it, but I still haven't seen it. I, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. See, that's where this, when you learn to overcome offense, 
that's where it takes you. Right there. It takes you to the point where you're willing to lay your life down. And that's your preparation. You talk about a preparation for persecution. That is the best one there is right there. Where you give your life to the Lord. I'm, John Wimber, you said this better than anybody I ever heard in the pulpit. He said, God, I want to be change in your pocket so that you can spend me any way you want to. Now, there's a surrender prayer right there. I want to be change in your pocket and you can spend me any way you want to. Now, give me the grace and give me the power to walk it out. And if it's martyrdom, then give me the grace to walk through it right into eternity. Hallelujah. And if it takes an angel strengthen me for it, then send him in Jesus' name. But you promise something. Jesus has been made to sit at your right hand until your enemies are made your footstool. Now I want to see some of that. I volunteer. I want to see some of that. You said you'd do it. Now show it to me. I want to see some of that in this process. All of you will be made to stumble. I will never. <laughs> Jesus said, Peter, before the rooster crows, you will deny me. Three, not once, not twice. Three times. I, th I think what this teaches us is we probably owe the Lord at least an ask. Is there an offense there that I don't recognize? Just so we can deal with it if it is. Holy Spirit will tell us the truth. And also, I think it points out a different way that you and I need to pray for people that we really have great love for, who, who have a, a hard walk. You pray, God, give them the grace to walk through the offense of not seeing your covenant promise until you bring them into the maturity that you've ordained for them. Give them the grace, give them the anointing, give them the strength in Jesus' name to overcome the offense of inactivity in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. It changes how you pray for people you really love, and it should. It should, praise the Lord. Okay, is there a pat? See, now, now the issue is, is there a pattern here? And I think that's where, uh, now, now I'm going to have to back up to Matthew 24, because Matthew 24 is Jesus teaching on the last day, all right? Uh, verse 1, Matthew 24, then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. His disciples came to him, showed him the building. Jesus said, I'm telling you, not one stone will be here that will not be thrown down, because they did not know the time of their visitation. It's coming, and it did within 40 years. Man, boom, there it was. The judgment fell. All right, and they say, okay, what is your coming? What's it going to be like? And Jesus picks it up in verse four. Now we're looking for a pattern. Is there scandalizo here that Jesus prophesies in the last day? If there is, this is a major issue, and it's something that we really need to get serious with. We need to do it now. I mean, stop playing around, get serious right now. Let's see. Verse four, Jesus answered and said to them, take heed, no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, saying I'm the Christ, deceive many. You will hear of wars, rumors of wars, see that you are not troubled. All these things must come, but the end is not yet. Nation rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilence, pandemic. Yes, saw that. Earthquakes, various places. All these are the beginning of sorrow. We obviously are the beginning of sorrow. First pandemic. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation, kill you. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many, with, verse 10, 24, 10, Matthew. And then many will be scandalizo, will betray one another, will hate one another. Right there. Jesus, when you hit persecution, people get offended. Oh, Lord, God, save us. Save us. Surrender. Surrender to God himself and let him build a relationship with you. Overcome this. You don't have to be one of these. Probably why God sent me back to teach this. You don't have to be one of these. Did Jesus say it would happen? Yes, he said it would happen. Just like it happened to Peter. Just like it happened to all the 12. He was faithful to come back and bring him out of it. You and I need to prepare right now. 
and you prepare with surrender. You prepare by saying yes to your relationship with the Father. Hallelujah. You say yes. Okay, God, I get it. I see it. And you finish the preparation of the gospel of John. And in 16, he says, first verse, deal with the fence because it's essential if you're going to build your relationship with the Father. They will put you out of the synagogues. Ah, I've been there, done that. Yes, the time is coming. That whoever kills you will think he offers God's service. These things they will do, do to you because they haven't known the Father or me. Because you represent the Father, you're going to face persecution. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I go away to him who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? Because I have said these things to you, sorrows filled your heart. Nevertheless, it's your advantage that I leave. Why? Three for one deal. If I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. Now, there's, there's your anointing. It's Holy Spirit conviction of righteousness because I go to the Father and you see me no more. Uh, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you. You cannot hear them now. Oh, you, you ought to circle that verse. Chisel it wood and put it on your wall. God wants to talk. God wants to show us things to come. He has many things he's going to say to us. But until we grow in our relationship with the Trinity. So how have we done? Well, Jesus, yeah, we're doing pretty good with Jesus, Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah. The Father, we have just entered the season where the Father is now coming to deepen his relationship with us. Why? Because we're going to represent him in the days ahead. We're going to fully represent the Godhead. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. Woo! For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. Hallelujah. There's the promise. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said, he will take of mine and declare it to you. There is a transitional realm of growth here. A little while, you will not see me. Again, a little while, you will see me because I go to the Father. Then some of his disciples said among themselves, what is this he says to us? A little while, you will not see me. Again, a little while, and you will see me. See, they didn't understand the resurrection. And we do, so that's real simple to us. Verse 18, they said, therefore, what is this that he says? A little while. We do not know what he's saying. Now, Jesus knew that they desired to ask. Are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said a little while, and you will not see me again a little while, you will see me? Verse 20, most assuredly I say to you, you will weep and lament, for the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. He was, he was only in the grave three days. So they were going to be sorrowful. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth, to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy. And that's what the resurrection's like. After the resurrection, you'll be the same way. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again. Your heart will rejoice. Your joy, no one will take from you. And in that day, you will ask me, oh, verse 23 and 24, in that day, as soon as the resurrection's complete, as soon as Jesus has ascended, as soon as he has presented his blood, as soon as he's bought and paid for the new covenant, in that day, after the resurrection, here it is. This is our day right here. Here it is. Man, you got to give these two verses, 23 and 24. You will ask me nothing, Jesus is saying. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive 
that your joy may be full. The Father wants to develop a relationship with you. Ask him, he will fulfill it so you have joy. You know him. Ask, you will move his hand. Ask the Father, you will move his hand. The reason why you walk fearless in the last days is because you grow in your relationship with the Father and you ask and you see his hand move. And man, when you know that, all of a sudden, this confidence comes. Well, I prayed and God did this. That's the season we're in, church. The Father wants to fill your joy. Say, so, well, how come he took so? Get over the offense. <laughs> get, get, over, get over the offense. Cut off the offense. Come on. Put it under the blood. Woo. God's on your side. I'm telling you, the father is developing relationship with his kids. It's his season. Revelation is his season. Come on. It's his season. And we're still here. Woo. These things, verse 25, these things I've spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language. I will tell you plainly about the father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you. What is Jesus teaching the 12? Okay, you are, you think you're losing relationship with me because I'm going away, but I'm coming back. We're going to indwell you, and you are getting a three for one exchange. You're going to have a relationship with the Spirit. He's going to show you things to come. You have, still have the same relationship with me, but I'll be in here. And the new relationship you're going to get to develop is with the Father. And boy, when you develop the relationship with the Father, now the door's open to the fullness of God. Who and who can resist? He's consuming fire. For our God is, read Hebrews 12, our God is a consuming fire. And when he baptized him in the Holy Spirit, he also sent a little blessing from the Father. He sent tongues of fire. Hallelujah. So every time you pray in the Spirit, you got a direct pipeline. Now, you don't know what you're saying, but God does. And the Holy Spirit will tell you sometimes. I'm going to read it again, verse 27. For the Father himself loves you. For the Father himself loves you. For the Father himself loves you. Because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father. I've come into the world again. I leave the world. I go to the Father. His disciples said to him, see, now you're speaking plainly and you're not using figurative speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and you have no need that anyone should question you. By this, we believe you came from God. Jesus answered, do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming, yes. And it's now come that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. And yet I'm not alone because the father is with me. These things I've spoken to you that in me, you may have peace in the world. You will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Peace is the greatest weapon because it gives you confidence in the last days. You have peace with God because you walk with the Trinity. You represent the Trinity. And by the way, what did the next sense we just got through John 17, uh, 16, what, what do we find the next three verses are? 17, one, two, and three. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you've given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, that they may know, that they may know that's relationship, that they may know that what has Jesus started doing? He has started praying about our relationship with the Father, with the Spirit, and with Him. Oh, hallelujah. What are we finding out? 
that the end time preparation is learning to relate, accepting that we are sons and daughters of God, taking it by force, decreeing it and acting like it. I'm going to represent God. I'm going to talk to him. The Holy Spirit's going to tell me things to come. I'm not asking for my own stuff. I'm asking according to his will and purpose. Therefore, I have it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Confidence comes from relationship with the Father. The ultimate confidence comes from relationship with my... Remember when Jesus said this? Remember the ultimate pressure. I mean, Peter took out his sword and he cut off the high priest here. And Jesus says, stop, and everybody falls down. And Jesus picks up his ear, puts his ear back on and heals him. Do you not think I could ask my father for 12 legions of angels? One angel killed 185,000 for Hezekiah. What do you think a legion would do? You take over the whole world with a legion. Do you not think I could ask for 12? There's no fear in Jesus. Why? He knows who he is. And there's no fear in the church who knows who they are. Oh, hallelujah. There was no fear in Jesus because he knew who he was. There is no fear in us when we know who we are. When we know the Father, we know the Spirit, we know the Son. Lord, in Jesus' name, vitally connect us because we've learned to know you, walk you, and do your word. We're not here to do our will. We're here to do yours. And we choose it. And we rejoice in it. And we say hallelujah to it. Amen. Man, where does time go? When you're in the word. Woo! Glory to God. Well, we got John 17 to finish. At least we got it introduced. Hallelujah. What do you come out of 16 with? You know the Father makes your joy full. He answers your prayer so you have confidence and you know him. Because you're going to need it for the last days. Where are you going? What you're going to anointing you're going to walk in. You're going to need to know the Father. And he's coming to make sure we do. So, Father, bless you people in Jesus' name. Lord, I'm asking you right now, as you have started uh, relating to me as Father, as you have been visiting me as Father, as you've been talking to me as Father, as you have been taking me on little trips, uh, prayer trips with you as Father, I'm asking you to do for your people right now in Jesus' name, that every single one of them will have the confidence of knowing you, of moving your hand. And when the day comes that they need to ask for a legion of angels, they'll be there. Hallelujah. Or if they just need two, <laughs> you give them two. <laughs> they could take over a city with two. Oh, bless them in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you for it. Well, go to wordofwork.org. There's some material there that'll really help you out. Some of those Bible studies have two years on them. Uh, 2018, uh, 2019, on the uh, nine sonship gifts. Hallelujah. That's great, great. It'll do for you what it did for the Apostle Paul. It's how he overcame blame, shame, and guilt for all the people he killed as he was ascending the ladder of success in Judaism. Fully delivered, full confidence. Hallelujah. Eradicate your past. You're a new creation. Now you need to walk like it. Radically take your position as a member of God's family. Hallelujah. It'll do more for you than anything else. It's who you are. But if you're having trouble, we'll help you. But after this series, we're going right back into those sonship gifts. Make sure you know that you know that you know so you get there. That's our commitment to you. So when you go to wordofwork.org, uh, pray about it and, and if you have a chance, sow some seed to be a real blessing to us. Help us continue, and we really appreciate it. God bless you. Get ready for the, I believe, the greatest season the church has ever had as here 
comes from God and nothing's impossible to us when you walk with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you next week, same time, same place. Father up.